perfecting your character is something you can't... Per Impossible. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Well, I, I should be open and know what I should do. At least I should know what I shouldn't do, right? You, but you, not, you should not only know what you shouldn't do, you should have an understanding of what you should do. You can investigate what the church fathers taught which were born around the birth of Jesus in the classical period in the Roman times. And you can look at what Christians are teaching today and you can see that we're teaching the same thing. If we remove that authority, then all we've got is, well, you've got your good way to live and I've got my good way to live. And your good way disagrees with my good way. Your good way contradicts my way. So who's gonna win? Should we live like you do or should we live like we do? I'm just saying that you shouldn't feel yourself belonging to a particular fellowship or a particular denomination so strongly that you would then denigrate your brothers and sisters in Christ. God, show me. You just made a statement. Right, I'm going to get it out. Yeah. Show me where Jesus taught that there's no such thing as a bad person. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Nice to, nice to meet you. Brother, uh, we're in Montford in Essex. Thanks be to God. Um, uh, right, indeed. Yeah. And uh, thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Uh, it's Not impressive. me, but Christ in me. I dad, I did. I'm praying for Kirill. I don't know what you think about uh, Patriarch Kirill. Yeah. Because I think he's the one person who can stop the stupidity that's going on. Yeah. But he's frightened of doing so. Yeah. I think. Stand a bit closer, bro, so that a microphone can pick up your voice. Oh, right. One of the questions I've got is, how does this all end? Yeah. And everybody comes here and they protest about how terrible everything is. Yeah. And we, we push Russia as far away from us as we possibly can. Yeah. And I can't help wondering, how far is too far? Because they need, with, with every reconciliation that happens, you have to invite people back. Yeah. And the difficulty that the... Russian Orthodox Church has got is that they seem to love Russia and they seem to love their own church but they don't love the people. So, so allow, me, allow, allow me to address your points because I, I think that there, there's a couple of points that I want to make. Firstly, too many Christians are allowing the British media to influence them in what they think the big agenda is. Mm. So when the media tells you that COVID is the agenda, all the Christians are talking about COVID. When the media tells you that uh, Russia is the agenda, every Christian starts talking about Russia. Christians, our agenda starts with the church. It yes. starts with the persecuted church particularly. Yes. And that is the agenda that we should be talking about, mm. is how do we help the church be triumphant over all of her enemies? And how do we help the persecuted church? How do we build Christian solidarity amongst one another? Stop going along like sheep all with yeah. the media agenda of the world. My second point, my second point. Too many Christians have a compromised identity. They link their Christian identity to some kind of nationalism, whether that nationalism be an ethnic nationalism or whether it be a civic nationalism. And that's what you're seeing in Russia and Ukraine. No, I'd agree with you. The that. reason why the Patriarch of Russia is going along with what the Russian state is doing is because the Russian Orthodox Church thinks of itself as Russian, not Christian. First, no, no, let me, let me finish, because there's a number of points. I will let you come back, absolutely. So what we need to do is, if we want Christians not to fight Christians, we have to elevate the Christian identity far above national identity so that national identities diminish into the past so that we Christians cannot conceive of picking up a gun and fighting against another Christian. Yes. Now, the other thing you've got to remember is that the Russian Orthodox Church has only recently come out of a hundred years of yeah. Soviet oppression yes. and every third bishop in the K every third bishop in the Russian Orthodox Church is a KGB yeah. spy. Yeah. I mean the Patriarch could be a KGB for all we know. Like so what we need to do is argue for a, a Catholic understanding of the church. Yes. That we are one people under God and that, that means that our loyalty is to one another as brothers and sisters, yes. not to the nation state. So I was going to join the British Army, and this will be where I land, and I'll let you reply. Yeah. 
I was going to join the British Army. Then the British Army started bombing Serbian Orthodox Christians. Yeah. And I suddenly realized I can't join an army that's going to kill Christians. No. And so I rejected joining the army. Yes. And, and this is how we've got to think. How, uh, okay, what, what else do you want to say? The, the, the odd thing that, uh, about the Russian problem, particularly to do with the Russian Orthodox problem, um, it's been going on for a very long length of time. And it's not as though that they haven't addressed this problem before. Because in the Council of Constantinople in 1872, yeah. They, they agreed that you cannot tie the church to, to an ethnicity. To an ethnicity. Yeah. Um, and to do so was actually heresy. Yes. So that, I mean, if you if you take Ruski Mir, yeah. the Russian world concept, yeah. um, which subsumes Ukrainianness into Russianness, yes. then that has to be that same heresy. Yeah, they're placing ethnicity above. I mean, the very fact that Russians speak about Holy Rus. Yes. There's no such thing as Holy Rus. No. There's a Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Finito. That's it. Yes. It's the church that he's made holy, not Russia. Yes. Like, you're not holy because you're Rus. You're holy because you're Christian. Yes. Now, the thing is, the Russian Orthodox Church has attempted to consecrate the institutions of Russia mm. to the church. But... The, the, or, or to form an uneasy alliance. But the reality is they've fallen into the trap of rather than demanding orthodox politicians use state institutions for the benefit of the church, yes. they've instead fallen into the trap of using the church for the benefit of the Russian state institutions. Yes, and they call that symphonia. Yeah. That and, and Henry did anyway. Uh, Henry, Henry would be another example of subserving the church to the state. Yes. So the Church of England does that often, which it is... It was created in order to be a creature of the state. Uh, it, totally. And so that's why as Christians, we need to change this in our minds, in our hearts, so that we identify as Christians, so that I'm united to you and you're not... Catholic again. Uh, yeah, ca you Catholic... No, I'm, you know, the thing is, when I say Catholic, I'm not talking about Roman Catholic. I'm talking about the idea of universal Christianity and the idea of a universal Christian identity. It's that is, with a small C. Yeah, so it's the idea of being disciples of Jesus before anything else, not disciples of the state, not disciples of culture, but disciples of Jesus. And when we do that, you find that the more a Christian draws closer to Jesus, the less important denominations are, Absolutely. the less important ethnicities are, the less important that nation states are. I'll give you an example. I mean, there's a guy who, who made an electric violin for me, and he's a lovely guy, and um, he's had, he ran a, a music shop in Birmingham. But he's, he's Roman Catholic by upbringing, yeah. and he, he married a Baptist, and they go to um, either church, so it doesn't really matter. He plays in their, their yeah. band wherever. Yeah. But they're Christians. And that's how it should be. And that's it, that's how it should it be. It doesn't really matter which church they were in. Lower, lo Jesus. lower the denominational walls. And yes. I want to be clear. I'm not saying that you shouldn't belong to a church. No. I'm just saying that you shouldn't feel yourself belonging to a particular fellowship or a particular denomination so strongly that you would then denigrate your brothers and sisters in no. Christ. We can we can recognise Christ in why, where why we prefer a particular structure. Yeah. So I have a particular preference for one denomination, and a, I bought, was brought up in another denomination, and I can see things that I struggle with about that. Yeah. Which means that I've drifted in one direction. I won't name them because I don't want to be yeah. denominationalist. Yeah. But um, that's just it's just where where is your focus? Your focus isn't on the people around you before God. Yeah. It's God and the people around Fix God. your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And everything else. Yeah. So so in, in terms of how that plays out, that means that Christians of every denomination and ethnicity and nationality should work together for the triumph of the church. Yes. Should work together to bring people to discipleship in Jesus Christ yes. and should work together to assist and aid the persecuted Christian. Yeah. Like, 
Like the, 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 the there was a Coptic priest murdered just two, de two days ago. Yeah? Christians can protest about BLM. Why can't we protest about the persecuted church? Why are our leaders so weak that they can't call us to activism for the persecuted church? So, so when you want Christian, Christianity to be a big thing again, you, you're thinking of harnessing it for political purposes, aren't you? No, no, no. I, I'm saying that our discipleship in the Lord includes every area of our life. So it includes how you're a mother, how you're a grandmother, but it also includes how you vote and what you vote for. It also includes where you shop and what you buy. So that means that, that means that our discipleship in the Lord includes how we interact with politics. And Christianity has its own political narrative. Islam has that. But yeah, thing, but yes. But, but just because Islam does, it and does something doesn't mean that we shouldn't do something. Muslims pray, does that mean we shouldn't pray? Talking about the, the most effective vehicle to accomplish your political purposes. Yes. I'm assuming you're, you're doing this for political purposes. You know no, I'm say? doing this because I believe in Jesus and I believe that Jesus is the Lord of my life and that includes the entirety of my life economic, political, social, and cultural. But, but, but Islam is more holistic than what you're trying to promote. Sorry? Islam is more holistic. If you want this sort of I'm thing, afraid, you just I'm say afraid it. that that's totally wrong and that shows a lack of education about Christianity. Christianity goes about the same issues but from a different angle. Chris, Christianity tries to say to you that you need to perfect your character and by perfecting your character, it's not, it is impossible. No, 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 we are all yeah, but I, I think what you're doing is you're making the, the perfect the enemy of the good. Perfecting your character is something you can't... Per Impossible. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Well, I, I should you know, know what I shouldn't do. At least I should know what I shouldn't do, right? Yeah, but you, not, you should not only know what you shouldn't do, you should have an understanding of what you should do. So the way that Christianity works is it's, it's about perfecting your character and when you perfect your character, you perfect your life. Yes. But that also includes perfecting your politics. So it's not the idea as you... How, one second. How, how am I to perfect it's, 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 one, it's not as you have mischaracterized that Islam is a more holistic system than Christianity. That's a total mischaracterization and demonstrates a lack of understanding of what it means to be a disciple. The way that you perfect your character is to perfect the practice of virtue in your life. What does that mean? It's so, 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 so what you need to do is you need to learn what the virtues are. What are they? So it's things like faith, hope, love, justice, chastity, um, hold on, and my mind's just gone black. Break courage, faithfulness, and then you... The Muslims say, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. Isn't that easier? No, it isn't, and I'll explain why. Because if you have a system of laws, right, that people have to do and don't have to do... They keep their the, identity. The problem... Oh, I agree, and we Christians need to keep our identity, absolutely. But let me explain why that, what you're saying is, doesn't work. Because if you have a code of laws, eventually those code of laws date. They become irrelevant. It happened. It happened. It happened. Islam doesn't have the eternal laws of God. It has the opinions of men, but it's false. And I'll give you an example. The Quran says that when you fast, you fast from the rising of the sun, and you know of the rising of the sun when you can tell a white line of the dawn from a dark line. But the fact is, you can't apply that principle everywhere. Why can't you apply that everywhere? Because the sun doesn't rise and set everywhere. So in other words... They should, they should just um, use mechantile. Right, but this Making is daylight hours. so. So basically, what that means is that they're having to adopt what the Quran says. They're having to change what the Quran says. Let them do that. Right, so that means that their system of laws are not perfect. They're man-made. Well, it's good enough. No, it you, isn't you good enough. Said, I'm sorry. Enough. It isn't. It isn't perfect, and it isn't good enough. Why what? Not? Because a religion. Because a religion. Because a religion that has to be universal has to be something that you can apply at all times, in all places, in all conditions. Christianity, because it's about dealing with the inner character, can be applied at all times, in all places, in all conditions. But a system of laws 
cannot by definition be applied all the time, everywhere, in all conditions. So Christianity is a more universal system than Islam. Another example to prove the same. If I said to you, this is the most important message you're ever going to hear. Confitio de omnipotenti et vobis fretres que peccavi congitatione. Is that message any good to you? You have to translate it. Is it any good to you? Well, I, I'm not it's Italian. Is it any good to you? I'm not Italian. So no, it isn't. I don't understand it. Exactly. So Islam is a message that's rooted to the Arabic language. Which means that anyone who's not an Arab is a servant of the Arabs to tell you what God said. Whereas in Christianity, because we are talking about the message, not the words. Because, but, but a translation isn't the Quran, is it? Well, I mean, the Bible was not. But the, but the thing is, you don't understand the difference. What you're doing is you're assuming that because it's true about Islam, it must also be true about Christianity. And that's a false logic. The Christian faith is not about the words of the Bible. The Christian faith is about the story of Jesus Christ. And that story can be translated into English, which means that you can literally read the message of God in English. You're not subservient to anyone except the faithfulness of the apostolic teaching translated. But you, you can't have that in Islam. translated into English since King James, so... Essentially, the major difference that you have is rather than following a set of rules, we are following the example of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. And the whole purpose of the life of the Christian is that we follow him and the way that we structure our lives and the practices that we do in terms of prayer, fasting, um, giving to the poor, and so on. And yeah, we fast as Christians. Yes. Um, those things we do and we dedicate them so that God can then transform our lives so that we want to do. Yeah. And it's that transformation of our hearts that changes the, your natural attitude. So, yes. So, for example. And the world around you. So, for example, I mean, I've been convicted about uh, the state of homelessness within the last five to ten years. Didn't care about the homeless before, but God's, God's worked in my life and switched something on. And now it bothers me. It really, really bothers me because it bothered Jesus. Yeah. And so, that's, so that... and that's God changing me, and me allowing God to change well, me, Jesus, so that I'm Jesus more like Jesus. Jesus himself. He kept wandering around Galilee, northern Galilee, yes, Lebanon, yes. and forth. He said that he said that the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place yeah, to let, rest his head but he the earth. Preach, preach. But he also said that Paul will always be with us. Paul? The poor oh. will always be with us. Correct, yes. and they are. But does does but does no, it's a true statement. Yeah, yeah, the, so, reason, so, the reason why the poor will always be with us. Where does Jesus say, don't worry about them? No. Well, the, the, the way he was saying it, in that particular context. No, he don't. no I'm sorry, you don't know the context. The, the, the ointment, yes. No, the, the, the because... The well, it costs so much money to buy that ointment. I'm, I'm sorry, but the, the, all you're demonstrating, sister, is a, a really a lot of ignorance on, on this issue. because I'm wrong about Because story? you're absolutely wrong, yes. Because Christ... Why, why, why so, sorry, one second, let me finish. So, so the reality is, Christians inspired by Jesus do more for homeless around the entire world. We singularly are the most charitable community. The Catholic Church on its own, before you add on all the other churches, is the largest charity in the world and it does the most for the poorest. Does more than the UN, does more than anyone else. The Salvation Army in this country, there's only 250,000 of them. They do more charitable work for the homeless than four million Muslims. So, that's a the land. That, but the point is, sister, this is irrelevant to what Jesus taught. The question that you have to decide for yourself is: Is Jesus Christ someone worth following? It doesn't matter whether there are lots of Christians or few Christians or whether they're good Christians or bad Christians. The question is, are you a Christian? The question is, are you a disciple of Jesus? And what do you think about Jesus? I'd ask it, just out of interest, what do you think about Jesus? I mean, that's like the story, just getting crucified, you know, not, not particularly... Nice. Well, 
I mean, it's like... I mean, crucifixion's yeah, not nice. Yeah, he, so he got himself executed, and um, Christians worship him, and... There are better prophets, like Moses and Jesus came with a book. What, what's, 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 what's wrong with, wor why is Jesus a, a worse prophet than Moses? Please explain. Because, because if, I, if, if I asked you, like, you know, would you, would you like to be, if you, could, if you had to choose between Muhammad and Jesus. I'd definitely choose Jesus. You, you'd like to be crucified, would you? I would definitely, for, let me ex yeah, exactly. No, Jesus. So no, no, no. Let me. Let, so I don't have to watch. Excuse me, sister. Yeah. Let, let me. Let me. Let uh, sister. Let me. I, I, I don't make that. Let, let, sister. Let me address your point. Right. Let, let, let me. Let me. Uh, sister. Let me address your point. If I followed Muhammad, I would have to accept that it's okay to have sex with children. That it's okay to sell I'm slaves. Sure. No, 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 no. Sister. Okay, let me. Let me finish. Let me finish. If I accept. No. Let me finish. Let me finish. If I accept Muhammad. I have to accept you can have sex with children, sell slaves, that you can persecute religious minorities. Hold on one second. I did this exercise, the, the very exactly. exercise. Christians no, let me finish. 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 Brother, brother, let me finish. Let me finish my point. Brother, let brother, sister. Okay, do you guys want to talk to one another? That was the Spanish. Right, if you want to talk to him, go over there and talk to him. No, no, if you want to talk to him, go over there and talk to him, because I was having a conversation that you interrupted. So go, go and talk to him if you don't want to talk to me. Okay, brother, let's step away. Let them talk. So, so, so my point, I just want to, I just want to finish, because the lady, the lady said, uh, let me t just address the camera. So the lady said, why would I choose Jesus over Muhammad? The fact of the matter is, this is exactly why I became a Christian, not a Muslim. What the lady over there doesn't understand is I actually considered being a Muslim and I rejected becoming a Muslim because of the example of Muhammad. Because I read in the Islamic sources about him raping people, about him torturing people, about him selling people as slaves, about him having sex with children, about him not caring about the deaths of women and children in war, about him mass murdering people. But then I looked at the example of Jesus and I saw in the example of Jesus a concrete example I could build my life on. A life of love and faith and hope. A life of chastity, courage, justice. A life of wisdom, a life of faithfulness. And I looked at that example and I could see that whether I act as an individual or whether I act as a corporate body, we can build a better kind of society by following Jesus than by following Muhammad. And the reality is that when you compare, as I did, and that's the truth that people don't like, I did make this comparison, Jesus stands out as a gleaming example to humanity that no one is better than, but most people that I meet are better than Muhammad because they didn't tra trade in slaves, they didn't permit their followers to rape captives. They didn't have sex with children. Now, when you look at Jesus and you ask people what they believe about Jesus, they say Jesus is a great man. Jesus is a great teacher. King of kings. King of kings. Well, if you believe that, follow him. If you believe that Jesus is a great teacher, why not incorporate his teachings into your life? Why just give him the title great teacher? Why not actually become his student if you think he's a great teacher? Is my logic flawed? If you recognize a great teacher, is there anything wrong in following that great teacher? So follow Jesus Christ as your teacher and take seriously what he says. Take seriously what he says about who he is. Take seriously about what he says you are. Take seriously about what he says you should do and how you should live your life. Are there any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Sorry? That's a great question. So Jesus gave a sermon on a mount. It's the famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said that you should be a peacemaker. No, no, no. I'm going to address your question, sir. Allow me to address your question. So when you look at Jesus' teachings, he talks about the interior of the soul. 
And he says that you should live your life based upon your internal motivations. So don't be act from a place of anger. Don't act from a place of lust. Don't act from a place of revenge. Don't act from a place of greed. Instead, act from a place of peace. Act from a place of humility. Act from a place of uh, justice and pursue. No, I'm, it's, no, I am answering your question. No, 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 I'm, I'm landing, sir, and I'm not going to be di diverted. You asked the question, how did Jesus teach us to live? And that is the question that I am asking. No, that's a different question, and I will also answer that. I will also answer that. But allow me to finish my first answer, and then I'll come on to your second question. So you can find this sermon, as the brother said, in Matthew chapter 5. This is, this is, sir, you, you've got to let me answer your first question. Because it doesn't matter. Brother, brother, please, please, bro, you're just feeding him his energy. Stop feeding him energy. If you ask a question, it's incumbent upon you to listen to the answer. It, that's just called manners. That's just called good manners. It's good manners. So this is how Jesus called us to live. Let me finish that answer and then I'll address your second question. So, so that's how Christ calls us to live, from our interior motivations. And our interior motivations have to be guided by the virtues, by the good. Now, how do we know that Jesus taught this? That's your second question. We know this because Jesus' followers who heard Jesus teach this sermon in village after village and town after town and town after town and city after city and who were sent out to teach the same things to village after village and town after town and city after city learned this teaching, incorporated it into their memory faithfully transmitted it and then it was recorded in the Gospels. That is how we know. No, I didn't say that, did I? Your, your question actually doesn't follow on from what I said at all. So, let me ask you your question. It's all about interpretation, which is irrelevant to the, the point before. No, no, no. And I'm going to answer it. You asked, you said, yes. Right, and I'm now going to address that follow-up question. You, yes, you, you just said it's all about interpretation. That's what you said. Did, am I lying against you? That's a statement. Is it, is it a, that is a statement. It's not a question. It's a statement. Right, so, let, let, okay, I'll uh, ask you a question and then I'll deal with both. So, my point is, how do you know what Jesus is teaching where when you didn't hear it from Jesus yourself? Right. So the question is, how do we know what Jesus is teaching is, even though we didn't hear it ourselves? So I'll refer you back to my earlier answer, and then I'll just expand on that earlier answer. Jesus went from village to village, teaching the same message again and 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 again. And then he sent out his apostles who taught the same message again and 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 again right so then they learned that message because they heard it so many times and repeated it so many times and then they wrote it in the gospels that's how we know what Jesus taught but let me expand that question to how do we know what Jesus meant because those same apostles, over the course of three years, discussed Jesus' teachings with Jesus. And they taught the church what Jesus meant when he said, turn the other cheek, rip out your eye, cut off your hand. And that's why Christians don't believe you should literally rip out your eye and cut off your hand. It's hyperbole. So this is how we know, because the community of faith preserve the interpretations of Jesus' teaching. Based on the mores of the day, which have changed over time. Okay. And there's no accounting for that evolution. So, so, what, you, what, so you're saying is, what you're saying is, based on your faith, what you believe is this. And that's fine. No, okay, no, no, it's all right, don't feed him energy, bro. Based on your faith, 
what you're talking about now is based on your faith and your belief that this to be the case. It doesn't necessarily mean it was Jesus' teaching. Can I reply to that? Yeah. Okay. No, bro, please. Be polite to the brother. Oh, sorry about that. So how, how, how can I know that it's Jesus' teaching? Because if you look over 2,000 years of Christian history, you can see the threads of Jesus' teaching consistently repeated down through 2,000 years, documented. So this is actually something you can do yourself. You can investigate this. And you can see, you can see that Christians have maintained the same values that the early church was preaching in the classical period just 100 years after Jesus. You can investigate what the church fathers taught, which were born around the birth of Jesus in the classical period in the Roman times, and you can look at what G Christians are teaching today, and you can see that we're teaching the same things. Now, there are obviously ignorant Christians. There's no doubt about that. There are obviously bad Christians. There's no doubt about that. No, there no, there are. There are. There are. There are. No, there are. No, show me. You just lied. Show me where Jesus said there's no such thing. Sir, I'm sorry. Sir, you. Sir, you. Sorry, sir. I was polite enough to answer a number of your questions. No, 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 one second. Sir, I answered a number of your questions very politely. And I asked you, you said Jesus taught that there's no such thing as a bad person. Right, so show me in Jesus' teaching. Let me get my Bible, show me where Jesus taught that. Bro, just leave the guy alone. You're not helping right now. God, show me, you just made a statement. Right, I'm going to get it out. Yeah. Show me where Jesus taught that there's no such thing as a bad person. Okay, where should I go? Okay, so that is a beautiful book. It wasn't written by Jesus. It That's was written by man. That's not answering the question. Yes, it is. How, you're saying, show me where Jesus said it. You, you're referring to a book. No. That was edited you by man. You made a by factual man. statement. <laughs> you <laughs> said, answer the question. My faith is such that Jesus said there is no such thing as a bad man. Based on what, sir? We're all children of God. Based on what? We're all children of God. Based on what? Based on the fact that if we're all children of God, God can't produce a bad thing. Right. So, right. Just, if you want to help me, bro, find the passage where Jesus said that no one is good but God. In fact, if you want to fight, if you want to help, find that passage. Yeah, can you find that passage? Yep. I'm just finding a reference. I'm just finding the reference. So, could pick up a book one second. And say, oh, look at this. It was Can we have a conversation? Shall we have a conversation? Shall we have a conversation? Oh, we're not having a conversation. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, he's just said he doesn't want to have a conversation, so now I will speak to you. The brother just said, ignorantly, he just said, Jesus never taught that there are such things as a bad people. That's what he said. And I asked him to verify his claims by showing some kind of evidence. Okay, find me that passage, please. Mark 10, 18. Mark 10, 8. No, Mark, Mark 10, verse 18. Listen to Jesus' words. In verse, in, in Mark, we'll read from verse 17. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Once I've got it, it's fine. I've got it now, bro. So Jesus literally said that no one is good except God alone. Which means that the brother literally contradicts Jesus. And this is the point. If you have an opinion about Jesus Christ, just because you think it, doesn't make it a fact. Just because you feel it, doesn't make it true. You have to marry up what you think and feel about Jesus to the evidence about Jesus. So if you have an opinion about Jesus Christ, you have to measure that against the evidence about Jesus Christ's life.
It is not sufficient for you simply to say, I think, I feel, I believe. Where is your evidence about what you think, what you feel, what you believe about Jesus? Christians base their beliefs, their thoughts about Jesus Christ on the only evidence available. That evidence is found in the New Testament. It was written before 90 AD by people who actually knew who Jesus Christ was. Which means that they're in a better position to tell you who Jesus Christ is than you are to tell yourself. So base your opinion and measure your beliefs against the evidence. Whether you accept it or not is a different question to what the evidence is and how you should handle the evidence. Be an intelligent investigator. Don't be someone who's filled up with pride and their own subjective opinions. That's not an unfair request, is it? Nope. That's a pretty fair request. Measure your opinions and beliefs against the evidence. And the only evidence that we have about Jesus Christ is found in the New Testament. Any questions? Any questions going once? Any questions going twice? Any questions going three times? The question is, was Jesus good? Bro, bro, let me please. So, the question was, was Jesus good? And the answer to that was answered by Jesus himself when he said, I am the good shepherd. So when Jesus said that there is no one who is good but God alone, and then said, I am the good shepherd, not only was he calling himself good, but he was calling himself God. Perfect. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Any other questions going once? Any challenges against the Trinitarians going once? Going twice? Any questions? No. Go on, bro. Being a good shepherd means that he was good at his job. So, what does it mean? Let me answer that question. What did it mean that Jesus was a good shepherd? Ladies and gentlemen, I say without any shame at all, you're all sheep and you all follow a shepherd. That shepherd might be the media, that shepherd might be the government, that shepherd might be the laws of the land, that shepherd might be the favorite, your favorite celebrity or your favorite political, philosophical or religious ideology. But I promise you, you are a sheep and you are following a shepherd. But Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus said that he is the one that should be the one to shepherd your thinking. That he is the one who should be the one to shepherd your emotions, your sentiments, your reactions, your beliefs, your prejudices, your values, your ethics, your politics, your taste in art, your taste in culture, your social norms, your economic practices should be based upon discipleship to Jesus Christ. Why? Because by following Jesus Christ, you guide yourself to the good because he is the good shepherd. Amen. You lead yourself away from spirits and emotions of revenge and lust and greed and envy and pride. You lead yourself away from ideas of gluttony. You lead yourselves towards faith and hope and charity and justice and courage and faithfulness and kindness and gentleness and self-control. This is the difference that our Lord makes 
in following him. The world teaches you to be vain and to think of yourself as the center of the world. That's right. Christ said to prefer your neighbor to yourself and to treat your neighbor as you would wish to be treated. Christ said to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Right. That implies that you do love yourself, that you do take care of yourself. But the good that you want for yourself is the good that you fight for, for your neighbor. The virtue signaling hypocrites of modern progressive society want to teach you that whatever you will, whatever you think, whatever you desire, you should do. That's wrong. And that even if in trampling under the people under your feet, you can pursue it. Don't believe me. Think I am lying. Explain to me cancel culture. Explain to me critical race theory and the villainization of white people just because they're white. Explain to me why we live in a culture that villainizes Christians and derides their faith and turns a blind eye to their persecution across the Islamic world. Why? Because the liberal progressives do not desire truth. What they desire is power. That is what they care about. And so they are more interested in dominating your life and encouraging you to envy as the communists and the socialists do, the rich. They encourage you to be greedy and prideful as the capitalists do. They encourage you to be self-centered as the liberal individualists do. But Jesus Christ calls you to a new community, a new humanity, the church, his body, those disciples who wish to lay down their lives as living sacrifices to him. That is what it means to be a good shepherd. Have no doubt you are a sheep and you are following a shepherd. The question should be, are you following the best shepherd? Many people will say openly, Jesus Christ was a great teacher. That's a common a perception and opinion in the world. Well, I simply say to you, if you believe that, then make him your teacher. Include his teachings in your life. Take seriously his statements about who he is, who you are, who God is, and how you should live. Any other questions? You said about power. Government and everybody, they just want power. What do Christians do when we get power? Great. So Jesus once said that he who is greatest in the kingdom of God is the servant of all. The Christian concept of the use of power is for the good of the whole. Brother, please. It is for the good of the whole. This is why Christians have a concept of the common good. Brothers, can one of you get me a drink of water? So, we have this concept of the common good. And we use power to serve other people, to empower their life, to set their life upon a just cause, in a just context. The Bible teaches that even the foreigner should be treated like the native born. That's in the Old Testament. Contrast this to the nationalist or the communist or the Islamist who uses political power 
to denigrate and subjugate and subvert the groups that they hate. The communist denigrates the rich. The nationalist, ethno-nationalist, denigrates those of another race or ethnicity. The Islamist denigrates the Christian and the Jew. But the Christian faith teaches that power should be used to empower the dignity in your own life Amen. so that you can live a dignified life. Right. When our politicians enter into public service to use power for themselves or their own ideology, they use the human person as a means to an end. But the Christian faith says that power should be used with the human person as the end in themselves. That the dignity that you have because you're made in the image of God should influence our use of politics and economics to dignify your life and to allow you to live a life in dignity and freedom. That contrasts to the Islamists who would denigrate the Christian to be second-class citizens known as dhimmis. Any other question? Okay, so brother, you've, you've asked a question with many, many examples in. Okay, so allow me to address them all. So the first thing that we have to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, is I am not inviting you to judge the Christian faith based upon the idea of good Christians or bad Christians. Every generation of Christians should be judged about how close or far away they fell from Jesus' teaching. And it is common parlance in public discourse that when a Christian talks as I am, that other people point to a list of examples of Christians in the past. The slave trade, the Spanish Inquisition, the Crusades, the British Empire. Now, the first thing that we need to recognize is that these examples are separated by hundreds of years. The Crusades happened over a thousand years ago, the British Empire over a hundred years ago. They're not the same thing. The British Empire is more properly born of Enlightenment philosophy rather than Christian faith. So I'll leave it to the Enlightenment philosophers to defend the British Empire. I do not defend the British Empire. But let's look at the Crusades. The Crusades were a completely justified reaction to the violent jihad of seven centuries of Islamic aggression. We Christians have absolutely nothing to apologize for for the Crusades. They were a response to the vile, ignorant, oppressive, determined attempt by the Islamic community to conquer Christian lands. No, ladies and gentlemen, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. I know that these ideas trigger people's emotions. But the reason why they trigger your emotions is because your sentiments and emotions have been shepherded by the liberal state. And I am saying, free yourself from the lies of the liberal propaganda machine and disciple yourself under Jesus Christ. 
He also raised the example of the Spanish Empire. There's absolute truth to the fact that that was an empire inspired by Christian faith. So I can't dismiss it in the same way I do the British Empire. But what I will say is that where those Spanish colonialists fell short of the teachings of Jesus, I stand with you in condemning them. But the full story of the Spanish Empire is not told to you by the liberal progressive propaganda machine. There were Christian Franciscan and Dominican priests who argued to the Pope and the King of Spain and the King of Portugal in defense of the native tribes of Latin America. They condemned the slave trade being practiced by the Spanish. And for a very brief moment in time, they won their argument. And this is how they argued. They said that the natives were now Christians and that their kingdoms should be respected like any kingdom in Europe. Just listen to what you heard there. That is the first example of universal rights. That the natives of America should be respected like the natives of Europe. But the settlers and the colonialists got round this by saying, fine. But when the kingdoms of Europe fight, they can fight. So we'll fight them in the same way. And there were many abuses that went along with that. So my point to you, sir, is that the examples that you gave are complicated. And I would ask you to judge them in the same way that I do. How close or far away do they fall from Jesus' teaching? And I'm not inviting you to follow a church. I'm inviting you to follow Jesus. Any other questions? Go on, bro. I can't shout, bro. I can't hear you. Um, so, I mean, I, I appreciate like um, following Jesus's teachings, but does that necessarily like you know what's written in the Bible is like a moral guide to live your life? But I respect that definitely. But does that mean you have to believe in all the? Well, I mean, I, w I would call it mysticism, honestly, that's in the Bible. You know, or physics defying miracles. Does that mean you have to believe those actually happened? Okay. Or can you follow Christian teachings without believing in a God? Right. So, so let's just change the battery for the camera. Action. So, in answer to your question. Can we believe that, you know, Christianity's got a moral guide, that's fine, but can we follow that teaching without believing in the, the mysticism? Is that fair? I'm not, I haven't lost a question. So, the, 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 uh, there's three points that I'd like to make to that. Firstly, number one, there's no contradiction between the idea of having metaphysical beliefs and a good understanding of science. Because if you believe that there's such a thing as good and bad, well, those are obviously metaphysical beliefs. You can't show me some physical example of good and you can't show me a physical example of bad. That's a metaphysical belief. So you can have a metaphysical belief without discarding science. The second point is that I would say is that the moral teachings of Christianity don't make sense without the belief in God. Because if we say that there is a God and God has called us to live a certain way, that underpins the idea that that way is the way that we should live. If we remove that authority, then all we've got is, well, you've got your good way to live and I've got my good way to live and your good way disagrees with my good way, your good way contradicts my way, so who's gonna win? Should we live like you do or should we live like we do? And that boils down to who's got the bigger gun, okay? Now, if you have a higher authority than me and you, then we can both appeal to that authority, okay? The final point I would, I would make is that the, the question is, what is truth? You see, if there really is a God and God has really spoken, then it's incumbent upon us to really follow what he says. So I don't think that you can have the moral teaching 
without the beliefs that come with it, because it's the beliefs that make the moral teaching make sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah, you, have, you haven't really convinced me, but you know, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Bro, before you go, have you got a Bible? Uh, I've got the New Testament. Uh, I would encourage you to read it, and if you've got any questions, come back another week and come and talk to me. It was nice to speak to you. Okay, take care. All right. And on that, guys, I'm done. I'm going to go and get a tea break. God bless.